it's Scott Manley here in The Reflection. Now, the reason I'm here is this is a, a little storage area where I have my telescopes. Now, I have uh, two telescopes here. There is a third one, but um, I actually want to talk about taking pictures of stars in the sky here. So this is the largest telescope I own. It's like an old, it's by Hardin, which they were an importer of Chinese telescopes. It's a 12 inch Newtonian reflector and it's on a very simple alt azimuth Dobsonian base. This is huge. This is, you know, this is taller than uh, both of my kids basically. Uh, it's the size of a water heater and it has a very great mirror so it collects a lot of light and it means you can see deep into the sky. It is absolutely useless for taking pho photographs however. It's a visual only telescope. Now this is only a 100 millimeter refractor with a 600 millimeter focal length. That means that the lens on this is only 100 millimeters. It's four inches, it's a third, which means that it has one ninth of the light collecting power of that uh, mirror-based system. However, it has one very important difference. It is on this kind of mount, which is called an equatorial mount. You see this plane here? This is aligned, uh, when I set this and point it north, it means it's aligned along the, uh, towards the North Pole, which means that when it rotates around that axis, everything exactly tracks the sky, assuming you can get it lined up to this. Now, that means that you can, of course, take long exposure photographs and track stars as you move across the sky and everything like that and get great pictures. However, it's entirely possible to take pictures of deep space objects and nebula and things like that using a, just a regular camera. And I say regular camera, this is actually a pretty fancy camera. It's my wife's, it's a Nikon, uh, you know, D5300. It has a, you know, the DSLRs have interchangeable lenses and this particular one is a zoom lens that goes all the way to 140 millimeter focal length. The longer the focal length, the more the zoom, just for those that are not uh, familiar with you know, camera functionality. Um, it has 20, 24 megapixel display, or sorry, 24 megapixel sensor, which is pretty good. I mean, frankly, I see cell phones that are advertising that, and I think it's completely ridiculous when you actually do the physics, counting how many photons get through the system. So you can use something like this, but you can also use any like point and shoot camera, assuming that you can get it to take lot, you know, exposures of more than a second or so. So yeah, I'm gonna give you a little guide on how to start with this. And the most important thing with these is you select manual mode. That's the M there. That lets you set your shutter speed. That's how long the shutter remains open. And uh, lets you set the sensitivity, in this case, the ISO settings you want. Depending upon what you're photographing, you might want different uh, settings on both of those. Uh, the other thing you want is a tripod to hold it steady. And finally, you need some way to activate it while your fingers are nowhere near it to stop it shaking, to make it shake. Now, uh, you can use the timer settings on this, right? So you can set it to take a photograph, you know, like two seconds after you let go of it. Or this one is Wi-Fi capable and you can actually get a phone app for it, which will let you use a remote shutter. Uh, also, you know, you can get little uh, things that will let you do, let you take pictures using just a, uh, shutter trigger device. Uh, those are all options and uh, if you get other devices you can do similar similar things. I'm just going to use this as an example because it's what I've got. Now the easiest thing to photograph is the moon because it's nice and bright. In fact these are a couple of cell phone camera pictures that I have taken. The only thing about the moon is it's actually so bright in a dark background that it tends to saturate out. So if you have a manual camera, you have to actually turn the brightness down so you can see details on the surface rather than just a ball of white light here. So I think this was 1 30th of a second at the low, at ISO 100, which was the lowest, the lowest sensitivity that the camera would go. However, in this particular phase, if you go the opposite way, then you can actually see the dark side of the moon, which uh, is of course not illuminated by the sun, but is instead illuminated by light reflected from the earth, also known as earthshine. 
For this, I turned the camera up to maximum sensitivity and uh, just handheld the picture. It was a 30th of a second exposure. And uh, yeah, you can just about make out details on this. And without breaking the bank, you can get uh, much better photos. This is an older one that I did by uh, taking my 15 by 70 binoculars. That's 15 times magnification. I have put them on a tripod, pointed them at the moon, and then held my iPhone up and took a picture through the lens. This is what I saw, which is pretty darn nice. For everything else, you're going to need long exposures. This is what a 15 second exposure of Orion looks like from my backyard. That is light pollution from being in the middle of a city. But if we zoom in here, we can actually see evidence for the Great Nebula in Orion. There it goes here. A very simple exposure here. We just let the camera run. We didn't bother tracking the sky. We didn't use any fancy mount. The only thing we did was use a remote trigger on the shutter to make sure the thing didn't wobble too much. And there you have it. Now, it is possible to get more detail than this, but there's a couple of problems to deal with. The first of all is, uh, first thing is I set the ISO of the camera to about 640, so I made it more sensitive, but in, in doing so, I created more noise in the picture there, so that's what that grain is. Now, uh, we can reduce the amount of noise by reducing the sensitivity, but then, of course, we lose light. So to make up for that, we could take a longer exposure. But if we take a longer exposure, what will happen is the stars will move across the field and the image will be smeared out. Now, if you've got a fancy telescope mount that will track the sky, you can solve that particular problem. But without it, there's another alternative. So setting the sensitivity lower, I just started taking a series of five second exposures. You can see these one after another. And if you look very carefully, you can see it's moving. Now there's software that will estimate the motion and combine the images, adding them all up into one effective long exposure with the motion reduced. And then with a bit of visual processing, you can extract out the sky background. And uh, sure enough, we should have a much clearer image in here of what makes up the nebula under there. So yeah, it doesn't look that great here, but it is a bit of an improvement regardless. But because we now have a way of dealing with the motion, we can actually zoom in the camera and take uh, even better images here. So this is taken at the maximum zoom on the camera, which is like equivalent of a 200 millimeter lens. And sure enough, we can see uh, the, the structure of this. Now you can actually see there is a bit of motion on all those stars there. But you can also see the effect of the extent of the Orion Nebula. And this is just a commodity camera. Now the software I use to combine images is it's called Registax. It's free. It was created by uh, astronomers who wanted to do this kind of thing. And there's a lot of other stuff you can do with it. Okay, so I'm going to show you how this software works so you can try using it yourself. Now, I uh, am actually going to use a set of images that I took several years ago. You can see the date is 2006. Oh my goodness, this is forever along, uh, forever ago. These are six megapixel images. I did this by taking my camera and mounting it on the telescope directly. Now, what I do is I go to the first frame and then using the mouse, I select a bunch of stars. Uh, these are going to be control points that the image recognition uses to try and keep them aligned. Now, uh, it, it can do this automatically, but I prefer to do it with a small number of points because if you let it just go crazy and select hundreds of points, it can take forever. Also, I like to keep it on only one CPU since I found some multi-core issues. So I click on a line and you can see that the images are being iterated over in the background. So you can see all the small variations. Even though my telescope had a drive system, it is uh, it is showing some movement between the frames because it was it's not a particularly powerful drive mechanism. It's not computer controlled. It doesn't use guide stars or anything. So yeah, I select all the images in my set and then I say limit. Limit is used if you're going to do lucky imaging, where you try to select the best images. But I'm just going to select all my images. And then I click stack. So the stack button is essentially lining up all the frames using the alignment data that's already been calculated from those stars. And uh, it's then adding everything up so that it's like you're taking one long exposure. And voila, we should get a smoother image. So if right away you can see that there's a lot more detail in this and the background is a lot less noisy. You can see the nebula and everything here. Isn't that glorious? 
Now once again I gotta stress this was actually mounted on my telescope which was tracking the sky. The magnification on this is equivalent to a 600 millimeter focal length and uh, it's a very simple lens so you can actually see there's a chromatic aberration around the stars. Now before you dump it out you can mess with uh, light curves and things like that to try and bring out more of the nebula. Uh, there's like a, uh, this is a gamma correction here and yeah, you can try and find a a suitable curve to accentuate more of the nebula. Clearly, this isn't working. What? I might uh I might go elsewhere. Instead, let's try and use the histogram tool. Now, histogram does let me access the individual color channels. So, what I really want to do here, I think, is subtract out the dark the the background in the sky here, right? So uh, you can see that there are various peaks and if I just move my color channels down below them I can kind of reset what my zero point is and perhaps make an attempt to drag out to you know to strip out the background brightness due to all the lights from living in the middle of a city. Yes, I would really like to live uh, in a place where I got super dark skies if I step out my back door, but uh, uh, digital trickery will actually get me a good part of the way there. So just continuing to try and strip out this background here. I think that's pretty acceptable. So we click do all and the camera or the program goes in and tries to paint out the image. And wow, look, we get to see a whole lot more of the Great Nebula in Orion. And I think you can actually see just a little hint of the Running Man Nebula on the left there. If you're dedicated, I don't doubt that you can pull out more information like this. But this is obviously going to be better than anything that you can do unless you have a telescope which has a mount. And I'm sure there are fans of my channel that have better gear than me. My whole point here is to show that you don't need to have super expensive gear. You just have to start taking pictures and see what you can do with them. Now to finish off, I actually just want to show you something that you will not be able to do unless you've got the gear. This is a, an image of Saturn. Now this is actually again an older image sequence. I recorded this using a converted web camera which I put on the eyepiece of my telescope and I, of course I added some uh, extra magnification and everything in line. And uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a single image that I got with the web camera and it looks interesting. You can see that it's Saturn because it's got rings but it's kind of grainy, it's faint. I actually purposely turned the brightness down because normally what happens is the the camera will overcompensate and just completely blow out the brightness of the planet leaving no information there. So by turning it down I can actually do something else. What I did was I recorded a video and if I drag this along the bottom you can see, well, you can see that I was actually kind of manually tracking this telescope to try and keep it on the planet. So the, the target is bouncing around, but also the atmosphere is causing the planet to shimmer, right? So the heat in the atmosphere causes it to be turbulent and causes it to move around and distort the image. There's something called lucky imaging, which lets you select the best images. So what I'm going to do is set the align points and you see it picks a few well chosen ones. Now I'm going to ask it to align and it'll go off and figure this out. Um, so yeah, what happens is the atmosphere causes distortions in the image of the planet or small objects or whatever. And some of them will be terrible but some of them will be really good and if you take a rapid video say 30 frames per second then you can write a piece of code which goes in and it finds just the good images and then builds your final image out of the good ones you can see some of these look good some of these look terrible and this is actually in the limiting setup right so it's actually using some software to figure out what the best frames are and I'm just going to go with its suggestion. So basically everything on this side of the slider is being kept. Everything on this side is getting thrown away. So it's keeping me, uh, it's keeping like 700 images. That's great. I'll limit it and now stack it and see how it looks. So again, goes off, crunches numbers, tries to add up all the images, tries to keep them all aligned and tries to make sure that we've only got the best images says uh three it's giving me a time estimate three two one and well we get a slightly better image here but you know using some processing we can probably bring out more details here so let's actually do 
view zoomed. I'm just going to bring that in here so we can see it uh, there. Now there's a wavelet sharpening you can use. You can tweak around these numbers here. Let's just see what happens when we slide these numbers up. Looks a little better. Uh, people will probably suggest that I'm perhaps creating information out of nothing, but that looks to me to be a bit of an improvement. I, I'm just whacking these up to 100% just to show you. People mess around with these things forever trying to get really good images. Look, you can see there's a band there. You can see the shadow of the planet on the rings there. You can see obviously the shadow of the rings against the planet there. There's a dark line which may or may not be in the, a gap in the rings, but that is recognizably Saturn. You can spend forever working on these things, getting great images. This was a web camera, right? Not necessarily designed for ast astrophysics by any means, but you were able to. I was able to take the lens off it, mount it at focus on my telescope, and build a video. And from the video, I've taken the best images, and so I can get a decent view of Saturn. So before I go, here's a few other pictures I've taken over the t over the years. I guess this is a uh, Mars from. 2005. This is, of course, another picture of the Orion Nebula with the Running Man just off to the left there, looking a little more apparent. Here's the Pleiades with uh, just enough adjustment to the color curves to bring out some of the nebulosity there from the background noise. Nice little snapshot of the Moon, although I guess at this point I should have cleaned the camera sensor before taking that picture. This is a planetary nebula. This is, uh, of course, a globular cluster and another globular cluster and the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant. It was a comet which showed its face in the, about five years ago and, of course, Andromeda. Now, none of these photos are going to set the world on fire in terms of quality, but I did them, them myself. And the message I want you to get is that you can actually do this yourself if you just get out there, point a camera at the sky, figure out how to take decent length exposures, and then combine them. Go on, give it a try. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.